He's a native son of Santa Cruz County, an avid cyclist, surfer, and climber. A newcomer to politics who recently became the youngest person on the Board of Supervisors. My guest tonight is Manu Koenig. Stay with us. Welcome, First District Supervisor Manu Koenig. We're happy you could join us today. Thank you, Becca. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Well, so we appreciate your time. I know you must be very busy getting your getting yourself going in your new job. Yeah, things are pretty have been pretty hectic for, for sure in the first <laughs> few months. I'm sure. I am sure it is. Let's um what I think it would be interesting for people to know. Um about your your uh, youth here. You grew up here in Santa Cruz, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, I was born at the old Frederick Street Hospital um, and then grew up at a house in, on Seabright for um, a couple of years. We, we moved around California a little bit uh, for my dad's work as I was a kid, first to LA, up to San Rafael. And then when I was about eight, we moved back uh, to Coralitos, where um, such as some family property, which was an old apple farm um, up Browns Valley Road. Uh, and I went to Mount Madonna School out there. Um, my, my grandfather has always lived in the county and lives um, down near 26th Avenue Beach. And so those have really been my two poles in the county, uh, Coralitos and uh, around 26th Avenue. Uh, and so I've gotten a good sense of, you know, country life and, and town life uh, together. And so I, I think that's really helpful in considering decisions for the county, um, you know, the unincorporated county uh, and um, both rural and urban settings. Sure, and you've um, you've uh, done a lot of playing in those urban, uh, the rural settings, surfing, cycling, climber. Can you talk a little bit about your uh, your sporting adventures? Sure. Um, you know, I of course one of the best parts about living in Santa Cruz County is all of the fabulous outdoor recreational activities uh, that we have available to us. Um, I've, I've always been an avid cyclist. Uh, my grandfather actually was an avid cyclist as well. It's why my family lives in Santa Cruz County today is because uh, he biked over here one day uh, from, from the Bay Area and basically never left. Um, and I, I love cycling because it's a way to get out there and, and see stuff firsthand. I mean, it's amazing how fast you can propel yourself across the landscape. Uh, and I, I think it's actually a, a great uh, hobby for a supervisor to have because, um, you know, I can go check on road conditions. So, you know, most people don't realize, but county supervisors were originally road supervisors. Our, our one and only job was to take care of the roads and sort of as county government grew, our, our job description grew. Uh, but just this past weekend, you know, I was going out and looking at some of the proposed segments for, uh, for new paving um, and saw them firsthand, you know, we went over them with my bike and said, yeah, we, we do need to do that segment. <laughs> um, so, so that's great. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've grown up climbing at uh, Pacific Edge. I've always loved that gym and um, get outside whenever I can as well. Love to go on long hikes uh, with my wife, Leah. Um, and then, you know, surfing, I, I didn't surf much as a kid, to be perfectly honest, between, um, uh, uh, you know, being based mostly in Coralitos. But, um, you know, the other thing is I just didn't really identify with the culture um as growing uh, as a kid and it wasn't until my adult life when i moved back to santa cruz uh you know after college um and after working in san francisco for a little bit um that i was able to approach it on my own terms uh and you know realize i could i could surf my way and you know didn't have to be a, a, a surfer or you know adhere to any specific cultural what, whatever norms <laughs> to be a surf enthusiast uh, yeah definitely. <laughs> Well, those are those are all, you know, kind of the Santa Cruz way. Everybody uh, dabbles in a little of that. And uh, those things uh, have come to play a role in um, how you see the world. Right. You're the it looks like the things that you are interested in in this county um, affect those communities, the surfers, the cyclists, the climbers. Uh, uh, all of us really, but but those in particular, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, but before we talk about that, can we talk about, um, you uh, You went to boarding school, just kind of unusual for Santa Cruz, doesn't happen a lot. What, what intrigued you? Why did you feel like um, you were the bear that could go over the mountain? Sure, um, so as I said, I, I went to Mount Madonna School, um, 
and you know got a great base in performing arts there actually i think it gives me a, a lot of the skills that i use today in elected office um but uh got a little tired of it after a while went to aptos junior high um and then um you know as i was considering moving on to Aptos High, that was pretty much my plan. Um, but my grandfather approached me and said, um, you know, have you considered your options for your education? And suggested uh, that I look at a boarding school called Deerfield in Massachusetts, uh, which is where he went to school. Um, and so uh, I, I applied and got in and um, it was an opportunity to do something really different um, and, and really to be very responsible for myself and my own education at a young age. Um, I think that's what I liked about it so much. It's just how much independence I had. And, um, you know, I think when, it, when it's not forced on, on kids, which, you know, absolutely wasn't for me. It was my own decision to go. Um, I think it can be a burn school can be a really great experience um, because, you know, rather than that conflict that so many of us experience in our teenage years with our parents. Um, you know, it's just, hey, you're do it yourself, you know, take responsibility for yourself. Uh, and instead, you're able to, you know, develop a more adult relationship with your parents, I think, earlier. Ah, so it's a little sounds like it was a bit empowering for you to leave home and be on your own somewhere. Definitely. Huh. Well, that is very interesting. Then, um, you were successful there and came back and went to Stanford and you had chose a very interesting major, management science, is that correct? Um, well, I studied management science and engineering. Yeah, uh, but I actually majored in German studies. Well, so that's I, interesting. Yeah, is that so family I, oriented? Um, yeah, you know, we were required to take a language at Stanford. I had taken French um, throughout high school. Uh, because my mother's side of the family comes from French Polynesia. Uh, and then I took German uh, in, at Stanford because my father's side of the jam, uh, a family originally is from Germany. Um, so uh, I, that's why I took the language and then ultimately um, majored in it and did an internship in Berlin working for Deutsche Bahn, the German rail system uh, for, for six months right after graduating. Well, that's interesting. So, oh, I think that's, That'll be interesting. We'll talk about that later. That's very cool. Sure. So, um, so that, so then, um, when you graduated, you went to work for for uh, Paystand in Scotts Valley. Is that right? Um, no, no, there's a, there's a couple steps in between there. I did go to work for a, an online advertising company um, in San Francisco uh, called Martini Media Network, uh, and so. That was, you know, I, really throughout Stanford, uh, I, you know, I, of course, wanted to work in startups and in tech and, um, you know, leverage technology to change and improve the world. And so then I went and worked for a tech company and as desired in San Francisco and, and kind of found, especially working in advertising, hey, not not every startup is changing the world for the better. Right? <laughs> we all know very well now, um, especially seeing films like The Social Dilemma. Um, and, it, you know, after doing that for close two years, uh, I decided to that, it, that if I was going to be working on the things that I wanted to work on, um, that I was going to have to do them myself. And so I quit my job in the city, moved home to Santa Cruz uh, and started Civonomics um, because you know, I wanted to impact public policy uh, and um, Really, what my, I think the driving factor is, was addressing the climate crisis. And, and just a little bit of background information. My name, Manu, uh, actually means bird in Hawaiian and Tahitian. Um, and so I grew up visiting my family in the islands. And, you know, even between the time um, that I was a toddler visiting my grandmother um, down there and being a you know teenager, 18 years old, it was pretty striking how much uh, change I, you could see in the coral reef ecosystem. You know, really going from those vibrant iridescent colors that you'd see in, in movies like Moana uh, to, to brown, to a lot of it dead and being replaced by algae. Uh, and that was a very scary feeling. Um, you know, that this place that you would kind of go to get away from, from it all, get away from the world, is seeing so much of the impact of what we're doing. Um, here on, on the mainland. Um, and so that has really been uh, one of the driving factors for me to, to work in public policy, uh, of course, with all that, uh, that along with all the wonderful values that uh, I absorbed growing up in Santa Cruz. Mm. 
Mm. Now, Civonomics, can you talk a little bit about how that worked? What what was the goal of it? It was an online app and mm -hmm. it encouraged people to take part in developing policy. But mm -hmm. how, did it, how did it work? Well, right. I mean, of course, the goal was, you know, especially affecting um, environmental policy and climate related policy, seeing that we kept getting stuck and, and weren't moving forward as fast as possible. Well, how can we just empower citizens to, to propose this legislation uh, directly? So the, the idea behind Siponomics was that anyone could propose a new policy idea, everyone could vote on it online. Um, and then, you know, sort of somehow that we would figure out, uh, you know, politicians or our representatives would adopt them and implement them because they could see there was so much popular support. That was the idea. Um, the reality was it was um, often hard to, you know, first to get elected officials to actually implement stuff. Um, people were also not very collaborative online, as you know, as we've seen uh, on on Facebook and uh, Twitter and other platforms. Actually, an online environment is um, doesn't work so well for collaboration. It actually tends to fuel division, um, and so that was an issue. Um, but what I think I learned, you know, we are bread and butter uh, for that company. I mean, we actually found it as a for-profit um, organization. If I do it again, it would probably be as a nonprofit. But um, uh, and so our bread and butter business uh, became doing polling and survey research for local government agencies. The Soquel Creek Water District was one of our first clients. We did many, uh, you know, polls and outreach uh, around economic policy for cities of Watsonville and Santa Cruz and uh, and the county of Santa Cruz itself. And what that gave me was a strong understanding of what it means to do a representative survey, a representative sample, right? Um, so that when you're looking at the responses, you have a you strong. Um, strong likelihood that they are representative of what people in the community actually think rather than what a very vocal minority thinks. And so I think that's the most important lesson that I took away from that experience, which I've uh, integrated into my time as an elected official. Mm -hmm. So did that prompt you to become an elected official? Well, what I, you know, in my desire through Civonomics was to make it easier for people to create ballot initiatives. And so when you know, it became kind of difficult to to meld all the various elements um, all with the the app. I decided, all right, well, maybe I just need to go to a, a more simple, minimum viable product, as they say. Like, what's the more basic version of this? Well, I just need to work on an initiative myself. And so that's how ultimately I became more directly involved in advocacy. Uh, first with fair vote, advocating for rank choice voting. Um, and we actually moved forward uh, with a proposal for ranked choice voting in the city of Santa Cruz, which I still think was a, is a great idea. Um, what we saw was a lot of the oxygen got taken out of the political environment uh, because rent control was a hot debate at the time. I mean, so literally the people only have so much attention space. Um, and so, you know, the, whether it was the signature gatherers who were out there collecting signatures for uh, to put measure M, the rank control measure on the ballot, instead of wanting to collect signatures for rank choice voting, or people donating, or just the public discourse, it wasn't the right time for it. Um, and so I got involved in the other most controversial issue in the county, uh, <laughs> which is the rail corridor debate. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that's I started working with Greenway, um, collecting signatures. We collected 10,000 signatures from throughout the, the county in support of a trail and not a train. Uh, ultimately became executive director of that organization um, and through that process worked on a ballot initiative, uh, as was my my goal, uh, Measure L in the city of Capitola to preserve the Capitola trestle for bikes and pedestrians and by inference, not a train. Not a train. So um, how does your background with the train system in Germany and uh, your background as a cycler uh, come together to uh, inform that decision? What what about trains do you know that you feel this would not be a good spot for them? I'm glad you asked. Uh, so I, I love trains, actually. Um, you know, that's why I worked for the German rail system. Uh, when I got back in 2008, I was happy to support high-speed rail uh, in California. Really excited when I heard that our county had purchased the rail line. We were finally going to get a passenger rail system in Santa Cruz County. Um, you know, I love being able to get around on transit and my bike and, and not owning a car. 
And what happened was basically five years went by and nothing happened. <laughs> uh, and I started to ask questions like, wait, well, what, where is this train and why isn't it happening? Um, and some of the things I realized as I looked into it more um, was, first of all, you, you can't actually build a great train on that old corridor. I mean, it's an old freight corridor. There's a single track. And that means you can't have a lot of trains, at least running in both directions at the same time. They'll run into each other. Now, there's a few spots where they're called sidings, where the trains, you know, one train can pull over and the other train can pass. But that still fundamentally, fundamentally limits the frequency of the trains. So instead of trains like, you know, ideally rush hour, you have trains running every five minutes. Um, you're really down to 20 or even 30 minute headways uh, with with that single line. So that's just not a very good public transit system. Um, you know, we have, there's a lot of data that shows that uh, mass adoption of, of transit happens when you get to 15 minute headway or less, because ultimately those headways factor into travel time, right? We're all trying to get everywhere, you know, as fast and cheap as possible. And so the longer you have to wait, the longer it's gonna take you and the less likely you are to ride. And there's there's not in some areas on that track. I walk that track with my dog. There's like no room on the side for people to stand there and wait for trains. <laughs> that yeah. would be I guess that would be a big construction expense. A absolutely right. That was another thing I realized was, wait, hey, the, the location of the stations hasn't been thought out. Uh, you know, if people are going to park to get, you know, then use the train hasn't been thought out and where the space for that would be uh, the cost of it. Um, there was just too many unknowns. And, and yeah, to your point, I mean, the rail corridor in general is quite narrow in, lo in some locations. Um, and, you know, the most obvious examples of that is, is the, uh, you know, over 20 trestles or, or rail bridges that exist out there. And, you know, you can only put a train or a trail on all those spots. So, um, yeah, you know, unfortunately, you really can't have both, not, not without paying a huge amount of money. Um, and so you got to choose. I think that the trail for bikes and pedestrians is better. And and part of that is because we could truly build a, you know, a bike highway, a, a micro mobility thoroughfare through the county that I think can actually will, will be a huge asset for transportation, really works with technology um, and, and will be a great way for people to get around in the future. So as you see that trail as a bicyclist or possibly a pedestrian, mm -hmm. um, uh, would that it, it would the idea be if we were going to use it as a transportation corridor? Would there be spurs off of it to lead us into the west side and the east side and Capitola and Watsonville? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, in fact, so I've done some work with People for Bikes, their nonprofit organization that helps cities to plan their bike network, and they did an analysis of Santa Cruz mm -hmm. County. Um, and it said so basically today out of a score of zero to 100, Santa Cruz scores a 22 uh, on our bike network. We're pretty bad, right? <laughs> um, if, if we built uh, the, the trail and the rail corridor um, or a greenway, it would bring us to a 26. Okay, a little better. Um, <laughs> but it's really only once you build out the whole network, when you um, when you build more protected or buffered bike lanes on streets like Capitola Road or Portola East Cliff or 17th Avenue or 41st Avenue, now all of a sudden people can really get uh, from door to door in a uh, you know on infrastructure that feels safe to them, and they're much more likely to ride. So when you when you build out all those uh, those spurs, as you say, or, or other connections. You get up to a 60, 66. Um, so now that's great. That's you know now you're talking about where like the level of a uh, uh, Boulder, Colorado, or um, Sevilla, Spain, or um, you know not quite Amsterdam yet, but um, pretty good. And I think we'd see a, a lot more people um, riding bikes or scooters or other micro mobility to get around. Yeah. Well, as someone who's really afraid to ride their bike on the street, I would like to know how, what is a protected bike lane and how protected would riders be in such a thing? Mm -hmm. Well, first off, I would say, uh, yeah, you, you should feel scared to ride your bike. I'm, I'm afraid uh, to say we're actually the third worst county in all of California for, for bike accidents and fatalities. So it really is dangerous out there. Yeah. Um, you know, but just one thing that 
kind of makes my blood boil is, is how we've had deaths in our county, you know, at the Harbor Bridge, uh, just in, back in 2018 over on SoCal Drive, going down into the village on the hill there. Um, you know, very recently down in Aptos near Rio Del Mar, and you know that we're not taking quick action to to respond and make those specific locations safer for cyclists. Um, so a protected bike lane, um, I mean, it's kind of degrees. You can uh, you can have a buffered bike lane where you sort of have like two white lines with the diagonal slashes in it that just provides more of a buffer uh, between cars and cyclists. And then it's protected if you have some actual physical barrier, whether it's like the channelizers that stick up um, or like maybe a, a round plastic or, or a rubber hump or something that'll actually keep bikes and pedestrians separate. Um, or you can also move the parking from the side of the street um, with the bike lane in between the cars and the parking to the parking closer to the travel lane for cars and put the, the bikes by the sidewalk. And that also is a lot better. That's interesting. Yeah, if I was much like, that would be a great barrier, a whole big car. <laughs> that would yeah. be, that'd right. be wonderful. I walk my dog on SoCal Drive and there is some places where there's no sidewalk and we walk on the shoulder of the road where the bicycles are mm -hmm. and cars just fly by you at like 40 miles an hour and they are close. I could reach out and touch them. We have just a little less than 10 minutes. So let me get to one of your other priorities, which I think is very interesting. I know that uh, homelessness is a, a big issue in Santa Cruz and has been from some time. So clearly, obviously that would be on your list, but you have some interesting ideas. And um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the idea of a mad managed community for homeless and how that would work and what it would look like and what the advantages would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, Becca, throughout the campaign, when I asked people what the most important local issue was to them, uh, they almost always said homelessness. So it's it's definitely um, one of the most urgent issues in our community that we address. Um, it was great to hear um, that the governor is going to be committing, what, what do you say, $12 billion uh, of, of new resources, state money to this problem. Um, and that creates opportunity for us to define the kind of, uh, of solutions and projects that we want to implement here in the county. And as you said, uh, I think that, you know, managed communities is, is really the best way to go. And I think the, the best way to understand it is someone once explained to me, people who are experiencing homelessness, they don't necessarily have a poverty of things so much as a poverty of relationships. And when you, we create a, a community where people uh, can rebuild and reinvest in those relationships um, with others and even with themselves, then that's really the, the fundamental basis from which someone can uh, recover from, from chronic homelessness. Um, and, you know, the communities like community, oh, sorry, it's redundant, but Community First Village in Austin, Texas is a great example of one of these places um, where they have a lot of work opportunities on site, um, it's also not all people recovering from homelessness. It's, it's run by a faith-based organization and they have people um, living in the community who are just there to help others and, and help um, manage the community in general. Um, so yeah, that, that's definitely a structure that empowers people, helps people reconnect uh, with a sense of self and a self sense of meaning. And I think that's all important um, when, for people to recover. And these communities utilize things like RVs and uh, tiny homes and, and things like that to house people. So uh, people do have their own little domicile, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there are uh, community kitchens and that kind of thing. Right. But it, it's it's close. It's a lot like normal life. It normalizes mm -hmm. um, things for them in a way they can't afford. Yeah, I think it's important for people, you know, to feel normal and to feel needed, right? I mean, when you look at sort of the alternative, which is we, we build build a permanent supportive housing and, you know, put people in a room where we're, you know, providing them everything they need and um, not necessarily have, don't give them anything to do all day. I mean, they feel isolated, they feel disconnected, and a lot of people don't want to live there long term. Um, so... It's, uh, it's really about helping people reconnect with the sense of meaning and, and giving people things to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, even when I was touring our county facilities here up at uh, 
in De La Viega, the armory where the county has been running an emergency shelter. It's what struck me the most is, you know, we're providing people shelter, we're providing people food, but there's no activities there during the day. I mean, other than catching a shuttle to go back downtown. Um, and so I think we have this opportunity to productively engage people and we should be using it. Yeah, we need to provide them a really a life. And mm -hmm. uh, I think they say if you do for others what they can do for themselves, you take away their self-esteem. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you can you can see that. So along those lines, one of the things that you had suggested was ADUs or movable tiny houses. And that mm -hmm. would fall, I'm guessing, in the area of the planning department. Yes. Is that what so what do you um how do you think that you can uh, communicate with the planning department to make them uh, receptive to those ideas? Um, well, they're actually, you know, we introduced, a, I introduced a board action working with um, Supervisor McPherson. Uh, it passed unanimously and um, now the planning department is working on a tiny house ordinance. Um, oh. so, yeah, uh, it, we, we communicated, it worked and it's moving forward. Um, it was actually the first action that I took uh, as a new supervisor. And so um, it's the process has gotten a, a little bit lengthy. Uh, I think I would have included some direction and um, when I first proposed it, if I could do it again, that helped to define that process a little more so it didn't get to, uh, out of hand. But I, I believe this year uh, we should have a, uh, an ordinance that legalizes movable tiny homes um, and possibly even uh, tiny house villages. Is there a place in Santa Cruz County where we could build such a village? I think there's multiple locations. Yeah. Ah, well, we'll look forward to that. So here you are uh, at the very beginning of your term. And uh, I'd like to imagine you're at the end of your first term. Mm -hmm. And if all things went the way you'd like, um, how would you have changed the lives of those of us in the county? Yeah, well, first of all, as, as we were talking with active transportation, I think the way all of us get around might be a little bit different. Um, so you're going to be more inclined to take a bike because you know that you're going to have a safe place to ride it. Uh, at, you know, at the end of four years, there should be a lot more protected bike lanes uh, for you to ride in. You know, the rail, uh, the trail in the corridor will have made some significant progress. We'll have some major sections done that you can ride on as well. And, you know, the end will be in sight that we get all 30 miles built. Um, and then well, I think we, need, we should build more housing, uh, particularly in the urban area, um, you know, by prioritizing housing instead of cars. Um, and precisely because you'll be able to uh, get around on active transportation and, and meanwhile will improve the transit system as well. So, you know, you'll be able to step out onto the street in front of your house and know that a bus is going to come in 10 minutes. <laughs> really? Uh, we yeah. Promise. Yeah. And then the and then the last piece, uh, you know, related to homelessness, I think, um, you know, I want all of us to feel empowered in addressing the solution um, and, and helping others. And so um, I think that you should be able to call a number. I mean, even if it's 911 and it's routed correctly uh, to a service that, you know, if you pass by someone who's homeless on the street and, and really suffering, uh, you know that you can connect them with a service that's going to help them, that's going to get them to a location where they can ultimately uh, heal and rebuild their lives. Well, Supervisor Manu Koenig, thank you so much for spending this time with us and sharing your thoughts and ideas. And um, uh, we hope to have you back again some at the end and see how you did. Thank you very much, Becca. Thank you for the opportunity and I uh, look forward to talking to you in about three and a half years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and thanks to you at home as well. Good night.